All right, what is up everybody? Tom and Girl here with a special Thanksgiving edition of our stream. Today we're gonna to be going over some more rustlings exercises. So if you followed the stream and you or you watched it on YouTube or you're watching on YouTube right now, last time we went over the rustlings exercises. We started, we got all the way up to macros. We made it through all the quizzes, we got to macros and we stopped there. And that's where we're gonna be picking up today with macros, which we haven't learned about yet technically. We haven't gotten that part of the book, but we're gonna let rustlings help us along with some of the hints if we need to. And we'll see how far we can get. We'll try to go through it and just see where we end up, see what uh, the rustlings hints will, will help us uh, with. And yeah, we'll go from there. Again, as usual, if you've missed any of the previous streams, you can find them all here on my YouTube channel. Just search my name, Tom McGurl. I'll also post a link to the YouTube channel in the chat there for anybody who's interested. We have all of the exercises here that we've gone through, all the chapters of the book. So last time, part 11, that's the first part of our wrestling's exercises. We have some one-off videos. Uh, right here, we have Rust development with Docker. So you can set up a local Rust environment without installing Rust, as long as you have Docker set up. Check that video out and you can see how to set up Rust. If you wanna try the wrestlings, it's a great place to start. Um, we also have all of the previous chapters. So chapter 10, nine, everything from chapters one to chapter uh, 10, which we've done can be found there. And then there's other videos as well. So in the past streams, we've done a video on building a AWS Lambda backend. So a serverless API with AWS Lambda backed by DynamoDB uh, for data storage with S3 for file storage. That was pretty cool. It's a two hour video. It was a full stream, but a lot of fun. We put together a serverless API. So if you've ever got you know, had any interest in that, definitely check that out. And prior to that, we built a React Native app with Expo, React, obviously, React Native, and we used Recoil.js, which is a new state management library uh, for uh, React. That's been pretty cool. Um, we checked that out. We'll probably revisit Recoil now that it's a little more mature than when it first came out and do something maybe a little smaller. Um, so more to follow on that. Also, if you're interested, you can follow me on Twitter where you'll get updates for when I go live as well as other just general coding content. And then as usual, everything we do here gets posted to my GitHub, all of the previous uh, exercise videos or any repos that went along with those exercises get posted here. So we have our Learn Rust Live. This is the one where we are going through the Rust book. You can find that there. Uh, you can go ahead and start it if you wanna get notifications on it uh, or watch it. You can download the code and run it yourself or start your own repo and do it that way. We also have um, our serverless API from that video can be found here. And all of these are linked in the video description, so you can always find them. So it's pretty easy. And here's our React Native app. Um, today, again, we're going to be continuing Rustlings. What is Rustlings? Well, if you weren't with us before, um, Rustlings is a group of exercises and quizzes. It's got an interactive CLI, so we'll run the CLI, we'll run some tests, and our objective is to follow the instructions in each exercise to make the test pass and get our code to work, and then we proceed on to the next bit of code. So it's been a really fun way to try out some of the concepts we learned in the book, and today even some that we haven't yet learned in the book, and get some experience with actually writing Rust code. So the book has been fantastic. We've been reading through, learned a lot. We've done a lot of exercises there, but Rustlings is really just going to focus on writing code, following it along, and getting tests to pass. And it's been really fun so far, so that's where we're going to start today. All right, so I'll pull it up here. Here's my Rustlings repo. Where we left off last time is we had just finished collections. So that was this part here where we did some work with hash maps as well as vectors, and today we're going to be running macros. So let's jump in and get started. You also may notice... We got some foliage, foliage, little foliage there, right? We got this leaf, we got some leaves, we got a little turkey buddy there. That's because it's Thanksgiving here in the States. Um, well, almost Thanksgiving, definitely Thanksgiving week. So I'm getting in that mode, right? I'm gonna be coding a little bit, gonna be playing some video games, uh, but today it's all about the rustlings. So let's jump in. <coughs> all right, so what we're gonna do first is we're going to uh, run our rustlings watch, which is gonna start a test watcher. And as we progress, it will move on to the next exercise. So to do that, we're just gonna run Rustlings Watch. Also, if you wanna install Rustlings yourself, you can find those instructions right here. There's a getting started for how to install it on Mac, how to install it on Windows, 
Linux, and so forth, and how to run through the exercises. We're running Rustling's Watch, which is going to let us <coughs> excuse me, continuously run um, our tests and update them and see if they pass. Or you can run individual exercises if you want to follow at your own pace or you want to try um, exercises without going through all of them. So if you're getting started here for the first time, you can run Rustling's Run and pick the exercise that we're doing today. All right, so let's see where we are at. So here we have, let me just make that a little bigger. So here we have um, macros one, which is where we're gonna start today. And it's saying that macro is not found in the scope. So what we can look at here is we can just kind of see what's going on. So it says, make me compile, execute rustling's hint, macros one for hint. Well, we've used macros before. If you've used the print LN, that is actually a macro. <clears throat> and one thing that they taught us in the book, a key thing about macros, is you have to use the exclamation point when you're using a macro. And so here we have this macro rules, which I'm assuming, again, we haven't learned this yet. I'm assuming is the way it's defining the macro and the macro name, and it's executing this function here. So if we wanna call it like a macro, we're gonna to need to add that exclamation point. So if I save that and we let our tests run down here, there we go. Successfully ran it, the code's compiling, and we can move on. And again, with rustlings, we just move on by removing this comment, I'm not done saving it and it's going to jump us to the next exercise all right next exercise is macros 2 let's pop over there there's macros 2 so this isn't compiling it looks very similar to our previous one um, we're trying to use the macro in the main function so i think what's going on here is the order's messed up right we've defined the macro after its use so i think if we just move this up save that that should work Awesome, everything compiles. So again, what we did there is we just made sure our macro was defined prior to us trying to use it. So we can remove our I'm not done and move on to macros three. All right, so macros three. Uh, macros rule, print ln. So it's saying aborting due to previous error, one warning omitted, and let's see what the error is. Cannot find macro, my macro in this scope. Okay, so let's see what it says make me compile without taking the macro out of the module execute wrestling's hint for hints so we have a module here called macros and we have our macro so we probably need to make our macro public now again i haven't tried this so let's just try making it public and right away it's going to complain try exporting the macro and it's giving us this hint down here so we're going to try to pop that on top so we're going to move this we will paste that here. Oh, not that, we'll paste. Get rid of this and we'll type out macro export. Save that and let's see if that works. Let's run wrestling's watch again because my error caused it to fail. It's running all the previous, right now it's just running all the previous ones that we did. So we've done a lot. Look at that, structs, strings, enums, quizzes, tests, modules, exercise collections. Awesome. So it successfully compiled and it was basically all we had to do to make sure we could use that down here was to add this module, this macro export on line eight. So we'll get rid of this and move on to the next one. All right. So next one is macros three. So let's open up, well, we have macros three here, macros four. So let's open up macros four. All right, so macros four is saying, make me compile, execute wrestling's hint for macro four hints. So let's see what's going on. So here it's pointing to this bit and it's saying that no rules expected this token in macro call. So we have this macro function. We have a few different, what it looks like are cases. Um, I'm not totally sure what this is. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at the macro section of the book and see if we can get some insights because I think we're going to need that to kind of continue here. So what we'll do there is we will go to our browser here. We're going to search Rust programming language. We'll go to the book, which can be found on the Rust website. And let's look for the section on macros. So that would be here, macros. All right, so we're just going to quickly go over this. This will help us get through our next step of our wrestlings. 
So the difference between macros and function, macros are a way of writing code that writes other code, which is known as metaprogramming. So you may have come across this in other languages. One of the languages I use a lot is Elixir, and Elixir also has the concept of macros, and they refer to it as metaprogramming as well. And so unlike a function that has code and returns code, uh, macros generate code. So that's pretty cool. So in Appendix C, we'll discuss the describe attribute, which generates implementation of various traits for you. We've also used the println and the vector macros. We've used those, right? Throughout the book, all these macros expand to produce more code than you've written manually. So that's what lets us do a lot much simpler syntax, right? Syntactical sugar on top of some other stuff. A function signature must declare the number of type parameters the function has. Macros, on the other hand, can take a variable number of parameters. We call print hello with one argument or many arguments. So that's the cool thing about a macro. Normally, when you define a function in Rust, you need to define the argument types, and they have a set number of types, right, so that it can compile. With a macro, we can call it with a different set of arguments, and then we're going to handle that in the functional body of the macro. So here's, this may look familiar. We've seen this, right, macro rules. In fact, if we go back to here, we can see macro rules. Macro rules. Um, Macro, they're sometimes referred to as macros, by example, macro rules, macros, or just plain macros. At their core, declarative macros allow you to write something similar to Rust match expression. That's, I think, what we're looking at. As discussed in Chapter 6, match expressions are control structures that take an expression, compare the resulting value of the expression of patterns, and then run the code associated with the matching pattern. So I believe that's what we're looking at here. It's almost like a match statement. Um, Macros also compare a value to patterns that are associated with their particular code. In this situation, uh, the value in the literal Rust source code passed to the macro, the patterns are compared with the structure of the source code. And the code associated with each pattern when matched replaces the code passed to the macro. This happens at compilation. Patatas in the chat, welcome back. I just got here. What are you doing today? Patatas, we are going through the Rustlings exercises. We started last week and we are now on the macro section. So check out the Rustlings repo, and we're going to be going through that today, starting with macros. And so we just took a quick jump in our book to the macro section so we can read a little bit about what's going on. All right. To define a macro, use the macro rules construct. Let's explore how to use the macro rules by looking at the vector macro is defined. So we're going to look at the definition of the vector macro, which we've used, right? Chapter 8 covered how we can use the vector macro to create a new vector with particular values. So here is the use case of the vector macro. We've used this in our collections chapter. And here is how it's implemented. So this is something where we're seeing something very similar here. And so I imagine this is the match. And I'm imagining this is something probably similar to like a regular expression or something that breaks down uh, what the arguments are to the macro. So let's see in more detail. The macro export annotation, which we just used in our previous um, wrestling's example, indicates that this macro should be made available whenever the crate in which this macro is defined is brought into scope. Without this annotation, the ma macro can't be brought into scope. So that was the issue we had with our last Rustlings one, and we solved that. When we start the macro definition with macro rules and the name of the macro we're defining without the exclamation mark, the name in this case, vec, is followed by curly brackets denoting the body of the macro definition. So we have the structure vec. So let's look at what the pattern is. So first, a set of parentheses encompasses the whole pattern. So that's this part here. This is a parenthesis here and this other parenthesis here. So they encompass the whole pattern. A dollar sign is next, followed by a set of parentheses that captures values that match the pattern within the parentheses for use in the replacement code. So that's referring to this bit here. So this captures values used within the replacement code. All right. Interesting. So let's see. Um, the structure of the vec body, some of the structure. Okay, wait, here it is. Here it is. Within the dollar sign parentheses is a dollar sign x expression which matches any Rust expression and gives the expression the name x. So in this case, what's happening is this matches any of the values passed in, and we'll call it x. And so what I'm guessing is happening is when you give it a vector with comma separated values, for each value in that vector, it's going to run this bit of code. And what it's doing is it's pushing onto the vector, which makes sense. It's making a new vector. It's a little syntactic sugar, right? So 
The following dollar sign parentheses indicates that a literal comma separator character could optionally appear after the code that matches the code in the parentheses. The asterisk specifies the pattern matches zero or more whatever precedes the star. So it sounds complicated, but I don't think it's too bad. So what we have here is an expression, and they're saying it can be followed by a comma with one or more expressions. And so what this ends up generating is code that looks something like this, where for each one, two, three, and you can see that here, the, the dollar sign X is replaced with each expression matched. When we call this macro with vector one, two, three, like we've done here, the code generated that replaced this macro call will be the following. All right, so it's just like a match expression. So in that case, let's go off what we have there. So basically, if we have a match, uh, we probably need to separate this with either a comma or a semicolon because it's different expressions. So let's do that. And there we go. We did it. Toss in the chat. The VEC macro is simplified. The actual one is a little more complicated than that. Yes, and it actually says that in the book, which is great. You can use the expand macros in the playground to see what VEC123 really expands to. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's super cool. Even the, the tooling just around this and being able to do that and seeing you, the fact that you can even use the expands macros to just see that is super cool. So we'll definitely have to try that out. But so all we had to do here was these are the two expressions. This, if we look at our macro here and break it down based on what we just read, this macro can take two forms, no arguments. And if no arguments pass, it will just print out, check out my macro. Or it can take an argument, and in which case it's capturing that argument in a variable called val, and then we're printing it out there. So very cool. Again, the cool thing about this is we didn't need to create two functions to handle this use case. We created one as a macro, and we can call it in these two different ways. And so our test pass, we get rid of that and move on to macros five, maybe. Yes, macros five. Oh, no, wait, quiz four. So we got to go to quiz four. All right, so let's see what the deal with quiz four is. This quiz covers these sections, modules and macros. Write a macro that passes the quiz. No hints this time. You can do it. Okay. So we have a macro here. And when we pass it world, it should return hello world. And when we pass it goodbye, it should return hello goodbye. So if we take our macro here, we can kind of steal this a bit. And we can write our macro up here. And what we can do is we need to handle the case where we take a value, which is what we have here, and append that value to the string hello. So basically, we only need the one case where we take the value, and we're going to append it to hello, and then the string, and then an exclamation point. So let's save that. All right, so here it's saying expected, let's see. That's okay, unused super. Here it says, note this error drains the macro. Assert my macro world expected the unit type found a string. So it expected the unit type found string. So that's because it expects it to return this, not just print it, and we've printed it. So instead what we'll do is we'll use format Save that. Oh, and remember, format's a macro. And so now our test failed, but it did, in fact, compile. So let's see what the failure was. So here we got, on the left, we got hello world. On the right, we got hello world. So here, the left was hello goodbye. Ah, it's because we have some extra characters, I think. So what we can do is we have an extra exclamation point because I think they were passing. Yes, yeah, so they were passing the exclamation point. So we just got rid of the exclamation point. Thank you, Patatas, in the chat for calling that out. It's already put in the text. Good call. So Patatas called out in the chat that the exclamation point was already passed, so we didn't need to include it there. And there we go. Our quiz passed. We used this to match the expression, and that was it. Now, if this test was a little more difficult, maybe, it would have added a third instance with where 
nothing was passed or maybe something different was passed, maybe two arguments, and then we'd have a match expression to handle that. So basically, if we wanted to show that, we could do something similar to this, right? So pretty cool. We will go ahead and get rid of our I'm not done to mark that we're done and move on to the next one. All right, next part, move semantics. So move semantics is going to be all about borrowing, right? Moving variables around, borrowing, taking ownership. And so here, let's look at what it says. So make me compile, execute rustling's hint for hints. And so there's nothing it's saying we can't do, so we can modify probably whatever we want. And you can see here, it gives us some error. That's actually a really useful tip. So here it's saying on line nine, we have a vector one declared. Um, it's saying try changing it to mutable. And then here it's saying vector one pushed cannot borrow as mutable because vector one is not mutable. So let's take a look at what's going on. So we have vector zero, which is a new vector. It's not using the vector syntax, it's just using the regular vector new syntax without the macro. We have vector one, which we're setting to fill vec and we're passing vec zero. And what that does is it's taking ownership of that vector, creating a mutable version, modifying it and returning it. And so that's going to be a problem. And let's go over why that's a problem. So here, when we call, and we learned about this in ownership, when we call fill vec and we pass it vec zero, fill vec is taking ownership, which is okay. But the thing is, when it takes ownership, we won't be able to use vec zero anymore, which is fine because we're not using vec zero anywhere within this scope anymore. So that's okay. Um, but if we look at the error here, it's saying it cannot borrow it as mutable. And that's because fill vec on line 13, or sorry, vec one here on line 13 is trying to mutate vec, but it's not mutable. So first what we can do is make vec mutable. And there we go, that's it. So again, what we did here was we tried to mutate vec one after setting it equal to the result of fill vec. Um, but vec wasn't declared as mutable. So by declaring it as mutable, everything works out and we're all good. So we'll go ahead and remove I'm not done, save that, on to the next one. Patatas, quiz from chat. What are the name, what are the name of this type of macros? That's a good question. We didn't really cover the macro chapter yet, so we don't necessarily know, but I believe from the book, I don't want to spoil it, but I'm gonna, we're dealing with declarative macros because we're using the macro rules. Let me know if that's correct. Okay, so this next one, move semantics two. Let's open this up. All right, so move semantics two. Let's see, make me compile without changing line 13. Okay, let's see. Line 13 is printing vec zero. Okay, so here's where borrowing is gonna become a problem. Let's talk about this. Line one, we create a vector called vec zero. Line two, we declare that mutable vec one. We pass vec zero to fill rec. So here's the problem. As soon as we pass it to fill rec, you can see that fill rec takes the value. It's gonna take ownership. So this line on line 13 is not gonna work because we no longer have ownership of vec zero and therefore we're not gonna be able to get the length and, and operate on it, right? And we can kind of see that here. You can see move occurs because vec zero has type vector, which does not implement the copy trait. It's not an integer, right? It's It doesn't implement the copy trait. So remember, if we were de dealing with JavaScript, you can think of this as like pass by reference, right? And so what happens is when we call fill vec, it, fill vec functions taking ownership. And you can see here, value moved here. And then we try to use it again, value borrowed after move, which is not gonna work. So here's what we can do. We, don't, we can't change 13, but what we can do is instead of giving fill vec the, or fill, we can call it fill vector, Instead of giving fill vector vec zero, we're going to give it a reference to vec zero. This way we can still use it down here. Now, within fill vec, we need to say that fill vec is going to take a reference to a vector. Now, because it's taking a reference to a vector, and we can actually change the name of this, we can call this vec zero and then use vec zero. Now it's taking a reference to a vector. 
So this line here would just make vec a reference to a vector because that's what vec zero is and we wouldn't be able to push on it. So what we're gonna have to do is borrow the value of vec zero. So, or we're actually gonna have to take the value and claim ownership on it, right? So let's try, I believe two owned should do this for us. And hell yeah. All right, let's go over that one more time because that happened a little fast. The original problem was we we're passing vec to, let's go back. We were passing vec to fill vec. So fill vec was taking ownership. And then it was trying to redeclare vec as mutable. And since it was taking ownership on line 13, this wouldn't work because we no longer have ownership of vec zero. So we, we can't borrow it here. So what we did instead was we made fill vec accept a reference by adding this ampersand here and the ampersand here. We changed the name of the variable. And then we created a mutable variable called vec from vec zero to owned, which takes the reference and gets the actual vector value of it in own form so that we can create a mutable vector from that. We then modify that mutable vector and return it. So we didn't change the return type. And because on line 10, we passed a reference, we still have access to vec zero's original value. And so that's why it works. So here we have it successfully ran. And so we can get rid of our, I'm not done, save it and move on to the next one. All right, move semantics. Oh, wait, ah, I didn't fully finish my, we got an error here. Ah, there we go. Now it should work. Move on to the next one. There we go. Move semantics three. Let me get this out of there. So it's a little easier. Okay move semantics three make me compile without adding new lines just changing existing lines no lines with multiple semicolons necessary because that'd be cheating that's just like adding multiple lines with semicolons so we just need to change lines we don't need to do anything else okay so let's look at what the error says cannot borrow as mutable so in our fill vec function here we're trying to borrow vector as mutable but it's not mutable cannot borrow vec as mutable okay so without adding lines, we can just change existing lines. So let's see how we're going to do this. So we have vec zero, which is a new vector, vec one, which is mutable, and we're passing it vec zero. So one thing we can do is we can let vec zero be mutable. And then we can specify that fill vec takes the mutable vector. Now it should be able to modify it and return that vector. So let's see if just doing that works. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Look at us, look at us, we didn't even learn, we didn't even learn this. No, we learned this, I'm just kidding. This isn't macros, we learned this. Um, so what did we do? Let's take a step back and look at what we did. It's saying it cannot borrow as mutable. You can see here in fill vec, they're trying to mutate vec, but vec has not been declared as mutable. Also vec here that's being passed here, vec zero is not being declared as mutable. So our first thing we did was declare vec as mutable. And then we said that the fill vec function takes a mutable vector. We just save that and everything worked. So now we'll get rid of I'm not done and move on. Look at us. Oh, Patata said, pretty sure vec zero mute is not necessary. This part. Well, let's see. I don't know if it'll go back. Nah, I don't think it's going to go back and test. But what we can do to test that is we can run it manually. So we could do rustlings run move semantics three. Yeah, it worked. Nice try. So all we needed to do, that's awesome. So all we needed to do is declare that fill vec takes a mutable vector. And we didn't need to actually make that mutable. Pretty cool. All right, so let's run rustlings watch again. And we're going to do, we're going to move on to move semantics four. I think it's the last one in this chapter. All right. So move semantics four. refactor this code so that instead of having vec zero and creating that vector in the main function, we instead create it within the fill vec function and transfer the freshly created vector from fill vec to its caller. Okay. Okay. So what we'll do is we want to move this. Here.
here. Get rid of that. We create vec, and what we can do is we can just do mute vec. And that should do it. Awesome. So what do we do here? We moved the creation of vec zero to our function where we just create a mutable vector. We mutate it and we just return it. And we're all good. Nice. All right. Let's see. What are we on now? Let's remove I'm not done. And let's see where we're at. All right, now we're on errors one. Ooh, errors one. This we can do, we can do this one, I think. All right, this function refuses to generate text to be printed on a name tag if you pass it an empty string. It'd be nicer if it explained what the problem was instead of just sometimes returning none. The second test currently does not compile or pass, but it illustrates the behavior we would like the function to have. Okay, so let's look at our tests. So we have this generates name tag text for a non empty name. So it asserts that calling generate name tag text, passing it Beyonce, returns the correct string. And it says here, this test passes initially if you comment out the second test. You'll need to update what this test expects when you change the function under test. Okay, so we might need to, we're gonna need to change this assertion when we update our function to handle this below test. This below test, is expecting that when you call generate name tag text with an empty string, it returns an error. And this is the error that it expects. However, right now what it's returning is none if there's nothing passed. So let's adjust this. So how we're gonna do this is we're gonna go ahead and copy this text because we know we need to return an error. So we're just gonna copy this. And instead of none, we need to return an error. Now, here's the interesting thing. So we're gonna actually return that. Okay, so here's the interesting thing. Our return type right now is option. Now options are either some thing or none. If we wanna return an error, we need to use the result type, which you may remember is either okay or error. And so that's why I think we're allowed to change this down here, because we can change this to okay instead of some. So again, right now it's returning an option. An option is either none or sum, which is what we had before, and that's why it was comp compiling. But we need to return an error, so we'll need the result type. And the result type is parameterized by the two things it can return. In the OK case, we want it to return a string, and in the error case, we also want it to return a string. Now, instead of sum, remember, it's gonna return OK. Now down here, we need to assert, instead of sum, that it returns OK. And here we're asserting correctly that it returns error. So let's save that and see what happens. Bye. Let's go. Let's go. We're done. We did it. We did it. Let's go over it. Let's go over it. This is pretty cool. And it's okay. We were allowed to change the test. So we we're expected to change it. So what do we do? Let me just control Z back. So initially it returns an option type which again can be sum with a value, in this case string, so it can either be some string or none. Here you have some string or none. However, in our test, we, as we want it to actually return an error. And the way that we do that is with the result type, which is either okay with some type or error with some type. In this case, we know that we wanna return a string. So what did we do? We first copied oh, our string here, um, then we changed our type to be result string string because in the OK instance we wanted to return a string and in the error instance we wanted to return a string. We then updated our line 13 to return OK instead of sum. We then updated our assertion to expect OK and that's it. We saved it and our test is running. So pretty cool. Um, the result type has been you know something we learned. It was pretty fun. It was awesome. Patatas, should I explain? Ah, sorry, yeah, we moved on, but 
I do want to hear it. So feel free to put in the chat why that worked. And again, we're talking about why the vector zero without the mute worked for move semantics three. All right, errors two. Let's see. Woo! It's a long one. All right, let's read the thing first. Errors two. Say we're writing a game where you can buy items with tokens. All items cost five tokens. And whenever you purchase items, there is a processing fee of one token. So all items cost five. There's a processing fee whenever you purchase items of one. A player of the game will type how many items they want to buy. And the total cost function will calculate the total number of tokens. Since the player typed in the quantity, though, we get it as a string. And they might have typed anything, not just numbers. So they might have typed seven as a string. Or they might have typed lull or Tom stream is the best rest stream on Twitch right now. I don't know, whatever. They might type that. Right now, the function isn't handling the error case at all and isn't handling the success case properly either. What we want to do is if we call the parse function on a string that is not a number, like Tom's Twitch stream is best stream ever, whatever, that function will return a parse int error. And in that case, we want to immediately return that error from our function and not try to multiply and add. So we don't want to do any of the other steps. We want to instantly return. There are at least two ways to implement this that are both correct, but one is a lot shorter. Execute Rustling's hint two for hints on both ways. So let's read through the code first before we need to dive into our hints. So we have parse int error, total cost, which takes in an item quantity, which is a string slice, and it returns a result type parameterized by an OK of an integer 32, signed integer 32, and parameterized by an error type of parse int error. So this is what it returns when things are good. This is what it returns when things are bad. That's it. Pretty simple. Processing fee is 1. Cost per item is 5. Quantity is item quantity parse, because it's a string. We're going to parse that string into an integer 32. And then it's quantity times cost per item plus processing fee. So the processing fee is not per item. It's just on the overall order. It's like Ticketmaster, right? Like you, you buy a ticket, it's 10 bucks. Ticketmaster is going to charge you a $200 fee, right? Ticketmaster. Mod tests. All right. Here's the test. So these are the tests we need to get to pass. Item quantity is a valid number. So it asserts that total cost 34 when a, you know, a number is passed. It returns OK with 171. Item quality is an invalid number. Total cost is beep boop. Unwrap error to string. This is just how it gets the string. And it's expecting invalid digit found in string. OK. Again, what we want to do here, it's not handling the error case at all. And it isn't handling the success case properly either. What we want to do is if we call parse function on a string that is not a number, that function will return a parse int error. And in that case, we want to immediately return that error from our function and try not to multiply. So here, if we look at what's happening, it's saying, cannot multiply integer to standard result i32, standard num parse int error. So what that means is our quantity, the parse could fail. So the result of, so it cannot multiply integer to this. The integer it's referring to is the cost per item, right? The result I32 is the quantity, and that's the, the parse int error that it can possibly return. So what we need to do is we need to do a match here, right? And so what we can do is the following. And you, you can see it here where we did our, um, where is it here where we have okay and error so we want to match on this so what we'll do is we will do this let's try this out we're gonna do match okay and then we'll have the quantity 
And then what we'll do is we'll return this. And if it's an error, in this case, it's going to be a parse int error. Which I don't know what that's going to return, but we will return. I guess it's a string. Let's see. Let's see what this does. We're going to return error and we'll spit out this. All right. And we can return this. All right. So let's see what happens here. Parse int error, call expression requires function, parse int error defined here. Okay, so let's change this really quick to error, see if it gives us something similar. Okay, so here it expected a struct standard num parse int error, but it found a string slice. So what we'll do is we will return parse int error, save that, and Come on. Come on. We did it. Let's go over it. First, let's see what we got in the chat. Patatas, I actually call variable bindings. So let mute foo equal thing is immutable binding. This isn't mutable or immutable. Instead, the foo binding is. So the binding it is. When you pass ownership to a function, you create a new binding. So no matter if the previous binding was mutable or not, it only mattered what the new one is. Ah. Or you could add a question mark to the end. Ah. So yes, the question mark instead of doing the match. Yes. So we learned about that. So let's try that because we have this passing. First, let's go over this. Then we'll try it with the question mark syntax, which we learned. Good call, Patatas. All right, so what are we doing? Basically, in the success case, we assert OK. In the error case, we expect an error. Our return type is a result parameterized by an unsigned 32-bit integer in the OK case and a parse int error in the error case. We call processing v, we set up this variable, then we call item quality item quantity parse and we try to parse whatever's passed in because it's a string. We need to parse it as an integer. If that works, we use our match statement. If it's OK, we get the quantity and we can return OK with the quantity. If we get a parse int error, we're just going to pass that parse int error back. But as Patatas called out, because we learned about the question mark thing, that is equivalent to doing this. So if we comment this out, if you remember the question mark, if we put it at the end, if it's OK, it will return OK. And whatever it is you're trying to do, it will, it will just continue execution of the function. And if it fails, it'll just pass the error back to the caller, which is what we want exactly. You can, And you know we want that because, look, we're literally doing that right here, just passing the error on. So instead of doing this, we can learn that use that shorthand that we learned. So let's try that. So let's go here, item quantity. And so we'll do let quantity equal item quantity dot parse colon colon I32 question mark. And then here we can just try to return the results. Oh, let me just, I don't want to cut that. I want to. All right, let's see. Awesome. I love that. Pataz, thank you again for calling that out. That was awesome. Very cool. Ah, Pataz in the chat saying, actually, your code compiled not for the reason you think it passed. Try putting parse in there at the beginning of the match to see what I mean. Oh. I think this one's good. I like it with the question mark. So let's see what it's doing here. So here what's happening is we have item quantity. We're setting it equal to item quantity dot parse, and we put the question mark. If the question mark means if it's an error, it's just going to pass that error on back to the caller. So in this case, pass it back here. If it's successful, we continue our function, in which case we're just going to return OK with our values. 
So much cleaner, much nicer. We don't need the match statement. I love it. And we don't need to have this extra bit where we return the parse into error. And look at this. We had the spelling wrong. So no matter what, this was just the default, right? Um, so there we go. We're all set. Everything worked. Good to go. Let's remove I'm not done. On to the next one. All right, we're doing good, doing good on time. Okay, so now we're on errors three. Okay, let's see. This program, this is a program that is trying to use a complicated version of the total cost function from the previous exercise. It's not working though, why not? What should we do to fix it? All right, so we have to fix it because it's not working. So first of all, it says you cannot use the question mark operator in a function that returns the unit type. Okay, so let's see what's happening. Our main function returns the unit type. Uh, we have tokens, which are mutable. Pretend user input, which is eight. Cost equals total cost. It's passing a pretend user input with a question mark. And you can see here again, it's complaining about that because this is returning the unit type apparently uh, it's complaining on line 15 right so it's complaining about this line we'll see in a second if cost is greater than tokens print this otherwise tokens is minus equal cost and then print you now have this many tokens all right so here's what we're going to do see what we got all right let's see so total cost we're passing a pretend user input which is eight that's a string slice and here let's see what it's saying here item quantity parse 32 and so here our error again is saying cannot use the question mark operator in a function that returns the unit type. And here it says the question mark operator can only be used in a function that returns a result or option type. So let's see what's going on. So that's on line 15. So basically it's saying total cost does not return a result. But here we can see its type should be, right? It should be a result. So let's see what is going on. Let's see what's going on here. So we have processing fee, cost per item, quantity, item quantity, dot parse, integer 32 with a question mark, right? So it's going to return an error back here, or OK. So let's see. If we look at what we did previous to this, when we call parse, it was the same thing, item quantity parse, right? And then we had our quantity here. But here it's complaining because this thing returns the unit type. So let's see why it's complaining about that. So it thinks it still thinks total cost does not return a result type. Okay, okay. We're passing a string slice, that's right. Total cost quantity parse so it's trying to parse the item quantity it returns the error if that's the case ah I wonder if the problem is that we can't return an error from our main function because the main function ah right the main function does not return it doesn't return a result type the main function returns the unit type by default. So we need to specify that the main function can return a result type. And we did learn about this, and there's actually a hint here. The trait is not implemented for unit type. So we can modify our main function to specify that it returns a result type. And let's see how to do that. We're just going to Google it. Rust main function result type.
here we go. Ah, right, so we learned about this, right? So you can return result with the unit type. Results where it's parameterized by the unit type in the success case and the parse int error. And so this is just going to pass the error onto our caller, right, of this entire function here. All right, so there we go. So we are changing the return type of main so that it returns. Let me just fix this really quick. There we go. So it returns a result parameterized by the unit type in the OK case and the parse int error in the error case. And if we save that, OK, almost there. Mismatch types. You can't afford that many. OK, so let's take a look at what's going on down here. So here it says mismatch types. Expected enum result found the unit type because we just printed, right? So it expected a result, but we just printed. So what we have to do is, I'm sure it'll tell us. So it found the unit type, but expected a result. So what we'll do is we'll return Okay, same thing here. Look at that, look at that. It's better to put an okay at the end of the function. Oh. That's awesome. OK, so Patatas gave us a good hint. So instead of doing this and wrapping both, imagine if we have many if statements be a pain. We can just put an OK and return the unit type at the end of the function. I love that. Awesome. Great tip. I love that. That's much cleaner. Because like I was thinking, if we had many different cases, it would be a real pain to wrap everything in an OK. And it also doesn't really make it clear when it's returning, whereas here it's much nicer. It's you know We know it's the end of the function we have an implicit return here so awesome all right that was fun pretty cool it's cool to see these things in action like the question mark super nice just love that all right let's see what we got here this is what errors sn sn What is that? Errors n. Okay. Oh, ooh, look. It's, who's ready for this? Look at this leaf. Who's ready for this? Here's what it says. Errors n. This is a bigger errors exercise than the previous ones. You can do it. Yo, thank you, Brusslings. Thank you. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Edit the read and validate function only don't create any errors that do not already exist so many I love it. so many things could go wrong reading from standard in could produce an io error parsing the input could reduce a parse int error validating the input could produce a creation error defined below okay good because i was going to ask i've never seen that one how can we lump these errors into one general error that is what type goes where the question marks are and how do we return that type from the body of read and validate <sighs> may need to use the hint on this one not gonna lie not gonna lie all right let's see let's read through what we have first and we'll kind of go from there so we have error format io we're just pulling these in read and validate this is the only function we can modify and we need to figure out this part because there's so much that can go wrong and it says that so here let's see what can go wrong test with string this is a test helper function that returns turns a string into a buffer reader read and validate so this can return this test succeeds Test with string 42, assert equal positive non-integer, unwrap 
expected equals 42. So if it passes test with string, it expects it to equal 42. Test not number. So if you pass it a string, assert that x is an error. So when we call this, we get an error. Test non-positive. We should get an error when we call this. Test IO error. Struct broken. Um, IO read from broken. Read. So we're reading up this buffer, right? And this can create another type of error. Buffer read. So there's a lot that can go wrong here. A lot. Test positive non-integer creation. Okay. So we just had to figure out how to wrap these errors and return an error type. Now let's see what this function is doing. It's creating a mutable line, which is a new string, capital S string type, right? We're calling read line on B. B is a reference to a mutable buff read, which we're getting from, if we look for where read and validate's called, we're getting it from here. Uh, I believe this is also called from here. Number I64, trim parse. We're trying to get a number, right? We read the line, try to get a number out of that. Let answer positive non-integer new, creating a new positive non-integer. Oh, so it's, it's a struct defined below the test. So let's look at what that is. Ah, here it is. So it can cause a creation error. So we need to handle creation error, right? We need to handle error. So let's see. Oh, and then return the answer. So right now it's saying right away, expect an identifier. So let's just put something to get it to compile and we'll get more um, errors. Matthias in the chat said, boxed in error error, also known as the worst anyhow error. It's <laughs> awesome. All right, so let's put something generic here. So it's going to return answer if this is successful. I'm just going to put this for now, and we're going to say that it returns a creation error. Obviously, that's not going to satisfy everything, but it'll at least satisfy that case, and then we can go from there. Awesome. Okay. So expected I64 found a result. So on line 30, it found it expected a integer 64, but it got a result. So that's line 30. So here we need to do this. Now, keep in mind, this is a different error type. We need to group them. So let's see what's happening. So now when we do this, we got rid of that one. But we have some other new errors. So here, expected struct parse int error found creation error. Why is it saying that? It's because this is going to return a parse int error. But we're saying that our function returns a creation error because we've just lumped it all together, right? So we need to capture all of this. Here you can see also found creation error, but expected boxed box on this read and validate here. So let's try to steal something. I just want to see something. Just want to see something. Just going off that error message. All right. So what I did there is I let me just run that again. Sorry. So what did I try? I went off that error message. The error message said it was getting a creation error, but it expected a box. We haven't learned about this yet. We haven't come across this in the book. In the book. Patatas did post a link to the book part. So we're going to pull that up in a second. Thank you for that, Patatas. But first, I want to show why I, why I thought of that. So here you can see. Let me save. Expected struct standard box box found enum creation error. Expected result of some type and this but it got a creation error. So that's where I got that idea. Okay, let's take this, right? And so that I saw down here, I just copied it up here. We're gonna put it in place of, 
what I do in place of this up here. Save that and let's see what our new error is. So now it's saying expected enum standard result found positive non zero integer. So that's because we need to wrap this thing in. Okay. Now we got a failure. Let's see what the failure is. So this one failed test IO error. Um, and that's because we need to do it on here. Because read line could fail, right? And there we go. So read line can return an IO error. Line 30 can return a parse int error. And this one can return a creation error. And we've returned this type, which I'm assuming groups them, but we're going to read about that now. Uh, so Patas in the chat has linked it. So we'll pull that up. Thank you for that. And I trust this link, so I'm going to go ahead and pull it up. Okay. Use trait objects that allow for different values. Defining a trait for common behavior. Box T. Draw. Let's see. Let's see what this says. The syntax should look familiar from our discussion on how to define traits in chapter 10. Next comes new syntax. Define a struct named screen that holds a vector named components. This vector is of type box DYN, which is a trait object. It stands for any type inside a box that implements the draw trait. Oh, very cool. So it's inside the box. It has to implement that trait. So thank you, Batas. That's awesome. So what we're saying is it just implements the error trait. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. All right. We have to give a shout out again to Patatas in the chat for this because this is super cool. So what this does is it groups any type that implements the error trait. And of course, parse int error implements the error trait. Creation error implements the error trait. And our IO error implements the error trait. And that's why it's saying as long as it returns anything that implements that trait, we're good to go. That's super cool. We saw how to do this when we did traits. We saw how to do it with functions. But it's cool to see it in the return type like this in a result. Patas says, this means Rust forget the concrete type the error was. True. So you're not going to be able to pull information out of it, right? So like if you're trying to use that error, like let's say we weren't, we were actually trying to use that error, we wouldn't know the concrete type. And so we couldn't, if if let's say parse int error had some properties that the other errors did not, we wouldn't be able to get to them because Rust doesn't know. But that's very cool. So this was awesome. Uh, very interesting. I liked how we kind of went about it. We saw, we used the error message to figure out what it was. And then chat helped us out to figure out what it meant. And I love that. So just again, to go over it, we first added question marks because all of these things can return result types, right? So if I hover over this, maybe it'll show us, but no. Well, so we put the question mark because this can return an IO error. We put a question mark here because this can return a parse int error and this can return a creation error. And we've grouped them up in our response type where in the OK, we're parameterized by a positive non-zero integer, which is what answer is, and that's what we return. If there's an error, we're just returning any error that implements the error trait. And of course, all of those errors do. So very, very cool. Awesome. That was a fun one. All right, let's save that. Hmm. Moving on to option. All right. So let's go to option one. Make me compile. Execute rustlings hint option one for hints. Okay. Make it compile. You can modify anything except for this function's signature. So this function has a signature of option unsigned 16 bit integer. What that means is it will return either some unsigned 16 bit integer or none, right? So let's take a look. We're calling print number with 13. Here we're calling print number at 99. And what is our error saying? Oh, wait, so let's, let's keep reading. Um, we're creating immutable numbers vector here with five right of length five immutable vector that contains five options and then we're trying to iterate over those options 
we're then setting number to add and we're doing some math. But again, of course, because they're options, they may not be there, you may have none. So let's take a look. So our error says here, number to add. Expected enum, right, expected an option, but found an unsigned 16-bit integer. Try using a variant of the expected enum, some number, right? So if it's present. So number to add, we would do some iter, right? Because it's an option type. So that'll give us the value out of it. Now we need to make sure we handle the none case. So here you can see numbers, iter as you size, number to add. So here, number to add, because this is sum, because it might not be there, right? Okay, now let's get rid of this. We don't want this. So we fixed the first one. Let's see what it says now. So here, print 99, expected enum, option found integer. Try using a variant of the expected enum, sum 99. Meaning this expects an option. It's not returning an option, it expects an option to be passed. So we can pass it sum 13, sum 13. All right. Use of possibly uninitialized numbers. So here, well, number to add, it can be. So here, what it's saying is we have this vector numbers of options of length five. And here it's saying that we are trying to use a potentially uninitialized number. So they might, there might not be anything, right? So this may not be anything. Um, so what we can do is a few things. So we can't change the function signature, but to make this compile, what we can do is instead of returning this number to add, which is either the, the number from numbers, right? So, sorry, that was a little confusing. Let's go over it. So mutable numbers is a vector of option, right? So it can be some unsigned 16 bit or none five, meaning there's five of them. Here we're trying to iterate over that list. And so the thing is here is that since it's an option, you may have none there. So you may not have a value, right? This may not actually have a value. So we need to check to see if it has a value before we try to operate on it. So number to add here, we can't just say, oh, it's gonna work, we're gonna get a number out, because we might have none. So we need to make sure we're handling that. And so to do that, what we can do is something like if iter equals equals none, this might be the thing we do. We can just do uh, let's see, what are we trying to do here? Like what's the objective? Let's see. Numbers, number to add. Oh, so for every okay, so for every value we're adding a number to the array. I get it, I get it, I get it. So we're just looping over this is a new okay, so this is a range. This isn't using numbers yet. We're going over a range from, I see, we're, go, we're creating a range from zero to five and we're creating, inserting five numbers into this numbers list. And what is the number? It's whatever the value here is, is the number. So the first zero, so it starts out with zero, start then goes to one, two, three, four, five. And then we wanna insert it into numbers. And so iter in this case is just either zero through five. So we're saying insert at number zero, the number insert at number one, the number. So what we need to do
we had this, right? We're inserting some number. And here it's saying use of possibly uninitialized numbers, right? Because down here, numbers could be possibly uninitialized. So what we want to do is initialize it, I guess. Oh. Ah, it has to have five elements. So none. Oh, there's a way to do this. We could do, I think it's none. There's a way to say I want five of the same thing. I feel like it's something like this. Well, we could do this, but this is long form. But I think there's a way to, to specify I want five nuns. But let's see. Oh, and it wants an array, not a vector. So that's my mistake. All right, so that passed. But there, I think there is a shorthand for this. I think there's a shorthand for this. Let me see. Let's search it. Rust, Rust, create an array with uh, n of same value. All right, let's see. Um, ah, here's what we want. Yeah, so that should work. Okay, so we want none semicolon five. Awesome. All right, let's go over it. This is what we got going on. So we have print numbers. We have to pass it some because it specs an option. And then here we have this numbers array, which is of type option, and it contains five things. We initialize it with five nuns. That's what this does. It's saying give, put five none values here. Then we create a range from zero to five, which is the length of numbers. We're just saying for the number zero to five, we're going to insert a number at that index into numbers, and we're going to insert sum and then a number to add. So it's just going to insert um, a number for each spot, zero through five. So pretty cool. All right, let's remove the I am not done. And move on. All right, let's see what's next. Option two. I wonder how much more we have. Let's see, what, what do we have left? We've done primitive types, we've done strings, structs, standard library types we haven't done yet, I don't think. Yeah, we haven't done these yet. So that's definitely coming up. We've done move semantics now, we've done modules, macros, if, functions, error handling is what we are on, we just did. Uh, collections, we haven't done Clippy yet. Traits, we didn't do yet, I don't think. Yeah, we didn't do traits yet. So we still got a good amount to do, it's pretty sweet. All right, so now we are on options two. Okay, so for options two, let's see what it says here. Uh, make me compile. And then we have a to do. Uh, make this a while, make this a while let statement. Remember that vector pop also adds another layer of option T. You can stack option T's into while let and if let. Make this while let statement. Remember that vector pop also adds another layer of option T. You can stack option T's into while let and if let. Okay. So basically we wanna keep popping while there's values there. So let's see what this function does and break it down a little bit. Let option value equal sum string from rustlings. So it's, we're creating a string called rustlings and we're making it an option. Value equals well, first off, we need to declare this, right? Value equals optional value, print ln. So here it says to do, make this an if let statement whose value is some type. Got it. So 
make this an if let statement whose value is some type. So optional value is present. We're going to print this. The value optional value is value. Else the optional value doesn't contain anything. So we have to do an if let statement. So if value equal if optional value let's see what do we need to do here make this an if let statement whose value is some type okay so we need to do okay Let's see what we say in the chat. Patas can help us out. If let some value equal optional value. Yeah, we, we haven't come across this yet. So thank you for the help. Yeah, we haven't come across it yet in the book. I actually want to see what this says here. So let's go back to what it had here. So here it says expected one of found that. So we're going to try if let some, this is what Patas is saying. I want to take a look at this. If let some value equal optional value print ln. Okay. Interesting. So what happens now? Let's look this up. I'm going to look it up. Rust if let statement. Actually, while we're doing that too, let's do let's ask for the hint and see what the hint is. Rustlings hint option 2. Okay. Remember that options can be stacked in if let and while let. For example, sum sum variable variable 2. Okay, so here it's giving us the link. So let's follow these. This is really cool. I trust it. Okay. If let for some use cases when matching enums, match is awkward. For example, match optional. Some prints ln. If there's none type, it prints empty. So it's a you know pretty verbose, I guess, for a very simple thing, right? Matching on an option. Mm. If let is cleaner for this use case. And in addition, allows various fe failure options to be specified. So, all have type. All have type option I thirty two. Okay, so they're all all the things here of, of type option I thirty two. So we have some seven, we have none, and we have none, which we know fit that. The if let construct reads, if let destructures number into some I evaluate block blank. So the if let construct reads if let destructures number into some I then evaluate the block. Okay, so if let some I minus number Oh no, so if let some I equals number, which again it means if let destructures number into some I evaluate the block. Now, let's talk about that. We know about destructuring, right? We've destructured tuples. We've destructured um, different constructs, right, in collections. We, destructuring, you declare a variable, and you pull information out, like in a tuple. So here, what we're saying is it will destructure number, right? So if let destructures number into some i, if it works, evaluate the block little confusing basically what that means is if there's a number put it in i and evaluate the block otherwise do this so it's just like the match statement so here's how we're going to do that if optional value gets destructured into a string put it in value and do this otherwise do this and it's just like we basically did the same code here. 
if let okay and we can nest them is what is key here make this a while let statement so we got to learn about while let so let's check out while let while let similar to if let while let can make awkward match sequences more tolerable consider the following sequence that increments i so we have a mutable optional with sum zero and it's going to repeatedly try to test so we have a loop match optional sum i if i is greater than nine it's going to print this otherwise it's going to do this if it's none it'll just break Using while let makes the sequence much nicer. Make optional of type option I32. So that's the same thing. So we have this optional of type unsigned 32 bit integer set to zero to begin with. And this line reads while let destructures optional into some I. So while it's able to destructure into some I, evaluate the block else break. While let some optional I. So if optional is in fact an unsigned 32-bit integer put it in i and execute the first block in this case we're saying if i is greater than 9 execute this otherwise execute this if let had additional optional else else if clauses while let does not have these so if let had additional optional else slash else if clauses while let does not have these because while let is based off a condition of i okay crazy let's try it so we just learned about if let not a huge fan of that syntax but i get it i get it. it does it does make sense if this is a string put it in this option and assign it value and then you can use value okay so here what we're doing is we have a mutable vector of options of unsigned 8-bit integers or sorry signed 8-bit integers so we have a mutable vector of signed 8-bit integers and for each integer in this range 1 to 10 we push some value we push an option onto optional values then here we try to pop values off of optional values vec so it's saying make this a while let statement remember that pop also adds another layer of option you can stack option t's into while let and if let so our syntax here is while let some value and this is going to be optional vec pop this also returns an option right so here what we're going to have to do is handle that so let's see it says uh, you can stack option t's into while let and if let let's see if this will do it oh let's run wrestling's watch again Oh, we can stack them. Okay, so it's saying we can stack them here. Very cool. Wrestling's watch. See where we go. Awesome. We got some knowledge from Patatas in the chat. If number is a sum, then the value inside the sum is assigned to i. If let pattern equals expression, some value in, is a pattern that will assign to value in case that expression matches it. Yep, that's awesome. Okay, so we got it to compile. Let's read what we did because it was pretty wild. Basically, we have two things we learned. So the let, right? The if let. So what this does again is if optional value, right? If optional value is a string, it's going to store that string in this option here. So that's why we have some string. And if that, if this evaluates is true, because this is a thing, right? So it's trying to destructure. It's trying to destructure this statement, right? So I'm sorry, it's trying to destructure this expression. So you have a conditional here. 
it's basically saying if this destructuring is successful, execute this. If this destructuring is not successful, execute this. Here we have something similar. While this is true, what is true? Well, while we're able to get an option containing an option of a string, print this, otherwise break. So you, you can really just look at the first part. And other than that, it's just a basic if statement. The weird thing is there's a let there, right? But again, we, we know that this returns a value, right? It's not just doing the binding, we're returning a value here. And it's whether or not the destructuring was successful, right? So Patas mentioned this in the chat, it's an expression, right? It's actually gonna return true if it works. And at the same time, it's actually setting the value. So pretty cool. Here it looks a little more complicated, but all that's happening here is the same thing except pop returns an option. So instead of saying sum and then a value, we have to say sum and then an option. How do we specify an option? Well, we have our stacked option in here. So very cool, a little tricky, a little tricky. I'm sure as we learn more in the book, it'll be more clear, but really appreciating the hints that Rustlings is giving us, linking us the docs, and really appreciating the, the hints coming from the chat. So appreciate that. Obviously, if you're watching on YouTube, you're not seeing the chat, but I'm just trying to, I'm reading and reiterating what's going on there. So hopefully that's useful. But checking out if let in the docs and while let in the docs. And when we get there on the book, maybe we'll pull this exercise back up. All right, so let's get rid of our thing up here. I'm not done. Save it. And Russ, result one. So we're going to be talking about the result type, I guess, again. So let's see, we're at 1030. So let's do the result. Let's see how many are left in the result. We have, where's result? It's in, oh, it's in error handling. Okay, so it's part of error handling. So let's go to result one. Okay, make this test, oh, let me get that out of your way. Make this test pass. Execute Rustling's hint for hints. I'm not done. Okay, so we gotta make these tests pass. Let's see what they do. So we have a struct, positive, non-zero integer, right? It's an unsigned 64-bit integer. We have a derive here, which we haven't really learned much about, so we're gonna kinda of see that, but we have partial equality, debug. Well, we've learned about derive, right? We, we know that it has these traits, right? It has debug and partial equality, meaning it can be compared. So we did learn this part. We have an enum called creation error, negative and zero are the two within there. The implementation block for this structure. And when we create a new value, we can pass it a signed 64-bit integer. So we're gonna pass it a signed 64-bit integer and it returns a result of either a successful okay parameterized by a positive non-zero integer or a creation error. And so it's going to return OK, positive non-zero integer value as U64. So it's going to try to, if you've passed a positive non-zero integer, it's going to return OK. If you haven't, then you're going to have an issue, and it'll return a creation error. And then we're testing creation. Assert positive non-zero integer new 10 works. We assert that that works. We want to assert that passing a negative returns an error, a creation error negative. And we want to assert that calling it with a zero returns a creation error with zero. So how do we do that? Well, we are going to basically be trying to do this, right? So what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to call new. New gets passed in an unsigned 64-bit integer positive non-zero integer takes a 64-bit integer, so this should fail right away, right? So what we can do is we can do, we can either do a check, right? We can check if it's greater than or equal to zero, and if not, throw an error. So let's first try to do that. So we can do if value is greater than zero, Oh, one other thing, because we're passing a, um, if we pass a negative, this will fail, right? So we can first handle that case, right? By just checking if 
if this fails. So we can do this. If we run this right now, we'll see. We get some panics. Assertion failed, left equals right. Right, so what we can do is let's write a let's write a basic first. So if value equals equals zero, then we'll return again. We have to return an error. What kind of error? Creation error, zero. Else if value equals e is less than zero. So if it's negative, we'll return an error of type negative. All right. And then other than that, we'll just return this here. So we'll check this. All right, so what do we got here? Oh, we got some parentheses we can remove. All right. We got some parentheses we can remove. Ah, we can. Return these. And cool, we passed, but we can simplify this. We can do a match. We can do a few different things. So let's simplify this a bit. So we'll first comment this out and see what other ways we can do this. Let's see. In the chat, too, we have, yep, pattern matching right there, not saying this is wrong or this is better, but you can also do this with the match. Awesome. So that's exactly what we're going to try. So we're going to try with the match. So for our match, we can do zero. Oh, match value. Oh, we know what I have to do. I have to put it inside here. All right, so we'll do match on value and we can do zero. And if value zero, we'll return error creation zero. If it's greater than value, well, how do we actually match on a condition? That's the interesting thing. What's the syntax for matching on a condition? Maybe it's uh, value greater than zero or greater than zero. We could do, let's see. Let's see if this is the thing we could do. Match Rust match statement condition. I guess the pattern syntax is what we want. So one, two, blah, blah. Ah. So we can do a range is a range pattern, not a range expression. Thus only two types of ranges are supported. All right, all right. So let's try it with a range. So we can do Let's do one, two, whatever. That would be okay. We'll run our turn okay if that's the case. Okay, let's see. Message match x, two dot dot dot. Oh, I guess we just need dot 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 dot. Uh, let me see. I feel like that's not exactly what I want. 
2 dot dot equals 9 is a range pattern, not a range expression. Let's look at a range pattern. A pattern. Okay. Okay. A through D. Oh, this is cool. Oh, you know, we could. Okay, so what we can do is we can do. Let's see if we can do um, dot dot negative one, or we can do dot dot to zero. Oh, negative one. Oh, we need a starting point though. Basically, and everything else. So here, like if we did this, everything else, if we just said everything that was not zero, we can use this. But then this initial range is what we need to figure out. Fatah said, do we know match guards? No, but we don't know match guards. But this did mention match guards. Match arms can accept match guards to further refine the criteria for matching the case. Pattern guards appear after the pattern consists of a bool typed expression following the if keyword. Ah. Ah, so we can do. Oh, that's where the sum comes in. Okay, so we can do that. Let's. I like that. So basically what we can do is if it matches the conditional, we get sum x and we can process it. If we get none, meaning it doesn't match any of the conditions, then we have our last step. I like that. So let's do that. Let's do sum value if and basically x is less than 0. We're going to do... Um, we're going to return the negative. So some value if x is less than 0, we don't need that let. We'll do the same thing for 0. If x is equal to 0, we'll do 0. And then none, meaning it doesn't match any of these. And again, this has to be value. Value. If it's none, then we're good. So if it doesn't match either of these cases, then we're good. Let's see if that works. Ah, expected I64 enum found an option. So we have an option in this case. So what we need to do, oh, sorry, and just return. Let's see. Oh, sorry about that. Let's go back here. We have none. We're returning an option, which is OK there. That should be fine. Let's see. What does it complain about? Expected I64 found enum option option. Ah, because value as U64. So what we can do is we can just do here we need the value out of that so what we can do since we need the value out of that is we can just change this a little bit so we can do because we need to actually be able to get the value here and return it we can change this to some value and the condition will be if value is greater than zero and then here we can just do if it equals zero if it's not greater than zero and or it doesn't equal zero, then we can default to that here. And so this one can just be none. So if it doesn't match either of those cases, it's negative, and we can just return that. OK, so here it's still saying expected I64 found enum um, standard option. But let's see, this function, positive integer, can return u64 is OK. Assert error, creation error, when we call this. Ah. So remove the sum and none. 
Oh, because we don't need an option. Ah, interesting. So if we don't need the option, interesting. Okay, so that was because we were returning an option, but we don't need it, right? Because we can we can just return. We're returning an option here, but value isn't an option. Okay, so this works. So here what we have is we're saying value if value is greater than this, value if value is equal to this, we return. So if it's greater than zero, we're returning okay with a positive non-zero integer. And if it's not, if it's zero, we're returning this error which is coming from this enum here, zero, and anything else is negative, so we return that, and we're good. So we have our if statement, and we have our match statement, so a little bit different, but two good ways to do it. All right. All right, we're at 1042, let's see it. Let's see if we have any more in this chapter. If not, we'll call it here, but if, if we do, we can try to take it on, let's see. Clippy one. Okay, so we're done with the errors, next we're on to Clippy. So, it's 1042, so we're going to call it here because let's see, Clippy has, ah, Clippy only has two. Maybe we could just, let's let's see. Let's see if we can get through it. Why call it? Let's see. All right, so we're going to try it out. Clippy 1. The Clippy tool is a collection of lints to analyze your code so you can catch common mistakes and improve your Rust code. For these exercises, the code will fail to compile when there are Clippy warnings. Check Clippy suggestions from output to solve the exercise. Okay, let's do it. So we need to use Clippy. The code will fail to compile when there are Clippy warnings. Check Clippy suggestions from the output to solve the exercise. So consider comparing them with in some error. So here it says abort due to previous error, Clippy 1, y does not equal x. Consider comparing them within some error y minus x absolute value greater than error. Uh, I'm not sure what that's referring to. We can try it. Note, f32 epsilon and f64 epsilon are available for the error. I'm not sure what it's referring to here. Let's, I'm gonna use a hint. I'm gonna use a hint. Let's do rustlings hint clippy one. Floating point calculations are used in precise. Ah, so asking if two values are exactly equal is asking for trouble. Okay, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. I understand, I understand you. All right, so let's do what it's saying. So we wanna establish some some error, some standard error that we're okay with, right? So if it's outside the range of a certain amount of predictable error, we'll allow it. So Clippy's pretty cool. It's not just talking about formatting here. Clippy's like, Clippy's like, yo, you know math? You don't even know math, dude? Come on. Clippy's got us. Clippy has got us. All right, so are available for error. So let's, let's use that. So let's do let error equal f64 colon colon epsilon so we just like do that let's hover over this and here we're going to do we're going to copy this So we're going to do y, y minus x dot absolute value greater than error. Error equals epsilon. What is epsilon though? We need f64 epsilon. Let's see what it complains about. It should tell us how to actually use epsilon. Perfect. Use standard F64 
epsilon. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Look at this, look at this. Every time we run Wrestling's Watch, we're seeing all of our successes, all of our former success. We're doing great. Do we not do generics yet? I guess we haven't done generics yet. I mean, we've done generics in the book, but we have done this. All right, we're good. We are done. Awesome. Clippy's pretty cool. I like it. Let's save that. Let's go to Clippy 2. Ah, let's see what Clippy's saying here. Clippy says, for X in option. So deny Clippy for loops or fallibilities on by default, consider replacing for X in option with if let sum X equals option. So you can place, replace it with an if let. Ah. All right. And again, we're doing if let here, and it's equals option, and here's the the case there. So if it is equal to that, right? So if option can be destructured into some x, let it be x, and do this. Awesome. Clippy, look, the code is compiling. Clippy is happy. Woo! So why was that better? So let's take a look. It's because we're doing four x in option. Right, so we're checking for x in option, and we're doing result plus equals x. But again, option is an option, right? So the let, the if let syntax is perfect because it lets us destructure that and make sure there's a value there. So pretty cool. All right, let's remove I am not done. All right, next up is standard library types. Okay, so here's what we're gonna call it. We will finish these up next time. Thank you everyone for joining. This has been a lot of fun. We've done tons here. You can see when we run our, I'm just gonna run it again so we can see how far we've come. Rustling's watch, look at this. These are all the ones we've done. So awesome job. Thank you for joining uh, in the chat. If you've joined and participated with Tadis as usual, MVP of the chat today with the tips and tricks. So fantastic, thank you. If you're watching on YouTube, thank you for watching. Um, if you've missed anything or you jumped in and enjoyed this video and haven't watched the previous ones, definitely check them out. As usual, gonna plug it. So here we have the YouTube. We got plenty of videos on here. We did one on Rust development with Docker. So if you ever wanted to try out Docker, you didn't feel like you wanted to install Rust and you want to see what a self-contained little Rust environment could be like with Docker for development, check that out. You can find the first part of our Rustlings here, part 11, that's when we started Rustlings, all the chapters of the book, and some other stuff as well. We got a, a little uh, video here on live coding a serverless API. Check it out. If you were here since the beginning, you've already heard me do this spiel. Follow on Twitter for updates when I go live and post any new content. I will be tweeting that out. And again, I'll be pushing up the Rustlings repo here to GitHub so you can pull it down and follow along. That's it for tonight's stream. Happy Thanksgiving to those celebrating in the States. We had a special Thanksgiving stream. Really enjoyed anyone that stopped by. Shout out again to Patatas in the chat. Uh, Patatas Del Papa always, always coming through. Anyone else that was in the chat, appreciate that as well. Hope everyone enjoyed it. Again, we're gonna finish up Rustlings next Tuesday. So stick around. And if we finish early, we'll be going into chapter 11 of the Rust book. So thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching the videos. Again, follow on Twitter, subscribe on YouTube for updates and notifications. Part-time lover in the chat as well. All right, everyone enjoy. Those of you that are celebrating, enjoy your Thanksgiving. And everyone have an awesome night. Take care.